Hi, and welcome back to Waveform Science. As always, I am Jeff Hagen. Uh, so it is November of 2023, and Blue Eddy has released a number of new power stations. Uh, tonight, we're going to be taking a close look at the smallest one, the AC2A. So this power station has a 204 watt hour battery, a 300 watt inverter, so diminutive in size, uh, but it's got a bunch of goodies too. It's got app control, it's got a uh, USB, uh, USB power delivery port, 100 watts on it. Uh, it's got UPS mode. It's got a real grounding lug on the side of it. And it's uh, entry-level pricing. So that's real nice. Uh, as far as what's in the box with it, it comes with, of course, a uh, printed power uh, instruction manual, as we would expect. Uh, it comes with the uh, solar charging cable uh, with an XT60 connector on it, interestingly. Uh, not the DC7909 we would expect. Uh, it comes with a uh, regular computer power cord, so no charging bricks here. And uh, it does not come with the car charging cable. Uh, there's no car charging cable included, at least in the test model. They may include it later, but it's not in the test model for sure. Uh, however, it does take a standard um, cigarette lighter to XT60 cable, which can be found uh, certainly on Blue Eddy's site and uh, certainly many, many other places as well. So let's go ahead and run through a whole bunch of tests and see how it behaves. The most obvious model to compare the AC2A with within Blue Eddy's own lineup would be the EB3A. I have a very early model EB3A here. By the way, you can tell the later models because instead of simply having a hole for the ground pin, they have an actual plug on the later version. Um, the early version just has a hole. Uh, EB3A has a larger battery, 268 watt hours instead of 204 watt hours for AC2A. So uh, batteries, I don't know, about 30% bigger ish. Uh, it has uh, more output ports. Um, it's got the uh, cigarette lighter port, which of course they both have. Uh, this has the two USBs, but by the way, these are at 3 amps. These are at 2.4 amps, so even the regular USBs put out more power. Uh, the USB-C is pretty much the same between the two. This has the DC7909 jacks, which uh, this one does not. Uh, this one has two power outlets. Uh, this one has two power outlets. Uh, this one has a wireless charging port on top. That one doesn't. This one has a flashlight, that one doesn't, and this one is bigger and heavier. That's, that's going to be your main difference, is the EB3A is bigger and heavier. Not that much bigger, though. So here's front, here's the side, which is where we're going to see it's really quite the difference. EC2A is quite a bit smaller. EB3A, I kind of think of it as a power lunchbox. Whereas AC2A is a little bit smaller. The other, the other one we're going to use to compare it to um, is going to be a newer model. That's going to be the AC60. Of course, it is quite a lot bigger. Um, the battery that's in here is right about twice the size of the battery that's in the AC2A. Um, and we can see it. It's, you know, it, it's right about twice the size of the physical unit. It's actually a little bit bigger than twice the size in the physical unit. Um, they both have two power outlets. This has two, that has two. Uh, they both have the cigarette lighter jack. They both have one USB-C, and they both have two USB-As, although these are 3 amp ones. These are uh, 2.4 amp ones. Uh, this one has the wireless charging pad. That one doesn't. This one has a flashlight. That one doesn't. Um, but this is also much heavier and much bigger to carry around, whereas this is going to be a lot easier to move. So it kind of depends on what your needs are. AC2A weighs in at 7.8 pounds on my scale, 7.9 pounds from the manufacturer. Um, 10 pounds, by the way, for the EB3A, so it's a couple of pounds lighter than that. Energy density by weight is roughly about the same-ish as the EB3A, so not a huge difference there. It's a less energy dense than the B80 battery, but that's because the B80 battery doesn't have an inverter in it. And I've got a couple other models on there as well for comparison. Physical size of the AC2A is one of its biggest factors. It's the smallest um, power station they make it so far. And that's going to be about uh, 10 inches by about 7 inches. And on the side here, we're looking at about 6.5 inches, roughly. Uh, from the manufacturer, the volume is uh, 9.8 by 5.9 by 7.1, or 0 0.2 cubic feet of volume. 
Uh, EB3A, by the way, is 0.3 cubic feet of volume, so it's a little bit bigger in each of the three dimensions. Energy density by volume is a little bit less dense than EB3A and a little bit more dense than AC60, but that has to control the external batteries. Of course, the B80 battery is far more dense than any of these because it doesn't have an inverter. Let's take a look at the physical connectors on the AC2A. First off, the PV input itself is an XT60 connector, not the uh, DC7909 or 8mm jack that Blue Eddy uses on other devices. Uh, they have used the XT60 connector in the past on the EB55. Uh, they did not tell me why they switched connectors, and I did not ask. Uh, my guess is they had a recent uh, swath of failures on the DC7909 connector on different devices. I think they got a bad set of connectors in, and they swatched, swapped to a different one. Not a bad change. XT60 is a little bit more resilient. We've got, of course, the cigarette lighter jack right here. Uh, we've got a USB-C port. We've got two USB-A ports, interestingly marked 5V 2.4 amp, not marked 5V 3 amp. Uh, also not marked as uh, quick charge ports. Uh, we've got two AC outlets. The inverter's marked as 300 watts. Moving to the side of the device, we have a AC power inlet. Um, no power brick needed, just a regular computer power cord as is becoming more of the standard these days. Uh, down here we have a fuse holder. That's always nice, and by the way, the specs of the fuse are written right here. Uh, we have a grounding lug. That's also a nice thing to have uh, in the case where you are using a place where you have to be grounded. If I take a look at the back, uh, the entire back of the device is nothing but a giant sticker, including the serial number uh, back there. Uh, next side, we have the uh, just an air inlet, nothing else to it. Bottom of the device has uh, rubber feet, not much else there. And top of the device, the handle's a little bit different on this one. The handle is molded in, gives you a place to grab it, and it doesn't pop up. It's not lunchbox style anymore, but it does mean that when you carry it, it tends to be carried at a bit of an angle, like this, as opposed to being uh, straight up and down. DC output port testing. So we do have three DC outputs here. We have the cigarette lighter port, the USB-C, and the two USB-As. Let's go figure out exactly where those lie and how they work. So first off, well, how do you turn it on? Power button in the middle here. Then you hit the DC side. That turns on both this DC output and this DC output. They're, they are linked. So the cigarette lighter jack itself. First off, uh, it is regulated at 13.3 volts with no power coming out of it. Uh, when you get it up to about 8 amps, uh, you get 12.7 uh, volts. That's more of a normal load from a cigarette lighter port. And uh, you can get it all the way up to right around 11.8 amps, and it cuts off at 11.4 volts. So that works out to 134 watts-ish before it cuts off. So that's actually not bad at all. Next, uh, USB-C port. Uh, it does spec out as a USB power delivery port, 100 watts, 105 watts actually, and you can pull 100 watts from it. No problem there. Uh, USB-A ports. Uh, these spec out as Apple 2.4 ports, which makes sense. That's what's printed on the front of them. So unlike some of the other Blue Eddy devices, this is not a 3 amp port. This is a 2.4 amp port which means you can pull 2.4 amps out of it. So if you've got a device that really needs three, it's probably not gonna to be too happy here. Uh, it's gonna to wanna to run off USB-C through a port adapter in that case. Uh, but you can pull 2.4 amps out of it and you can pull 2.4 amps out of both ports simultaneously. So they do exactly what they're advertised to do. If we look at the top of the device, there is nothing for my wireless charging port tester to do because there is no wireless charging port. Some have speculated that they left this off because it wouldn't fit, too small perhaps, except that this little puck is the wireless charger that I use to recharge my phone on most evenings, and it fits just fine. So, next, grounding test. This is one of the first tests I do with a solar generator when I start testing it, because I don't like getting zapped, so I'm going to make sure all the grounds on the device are all connected to each other. 
So I'm going to set this to be my uh, beeper mode here, where in the case of this meter, so I have my two plugs here, when I touch them together, the meter makes a beeping noise. There we go, that tells me it's connected. So first off, I'm going to check the ground third pin on the AC adapter port, which is, if everybody remembers, the ground pin, and that should be connected to the ground lug on the side of the device. And it is, very good. So for the rest of this, to make this easier, I'm going to use the ground lug on the side of the device as my reference point, because I now know that that's connected to the third pin. So I'm going to connect this to the ground port on the outlet, which it should be. There we go. I'm going to take it to connect to the ground lug in the other outlet, which is good. Now, next, I'm actually going to turn on the AC inverter. The AC inverter in the device should have power coming on the hot side, this guy, not on the ground side. So if I turn that on, uh, by the way, do not run a continuity test on the hot side. Uh, you'll blow up your meter. But if I do it in the ground pin, this should still be connected. And it is. And this should still be connected. And it is. Very good. Next, I'm going to turn the AC side back off. I'm going to plug it into AC wall power. Plug this in. There we go. Turn that switch on. Now it's going to start charging. And it does. Very good. Now, at this point, the grounding lug on the side of the device should be connected to the ground in the outlet that it's plugged into. Because remember, the third pin on the device was in fact connected, third pin on the AC input was connected to the ground lug. So it should still be connected even when it's charging. So I'm going to test that. I'm going to put one tester into my outlet strip here on my table. There we go. I'm going to put the other tester onto the lug. And that should be connected. There we go. Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's nice and connected. Now, with the AC side turned off, the port on the front of the vise should be connected to the ground lug. And it is. Now, with the AC side turned on, same thing, that should be connected. Very good, that's connected. Next, we're going to run the same test off of uh, solar, simulated solar anyway. So I have my AC wall plug here. This is now disconnected. And I'm going to plug into my DC power supply, which is set at uh, 15 volts. So we've got a little bit over 100 watts of charging. There we go. Give that a second to pick it up. Turn the AC side off to start with. There we go. So now we're charging. And I should have this connected to the ground lug. And I do. That's correct. And I should be able to turn this on. I should have this connected to the ground lug. Very good. So we've gone through and tested every possible combination, which means that it is correctly grounded to the ground lug on the side of the device all the time. Doesn't matter how it charges. It can charge from AC or DC. It can be turned on or turned off. Your devices are grounded either way. Very good. AC max load testing, where we're going to use the infamous heat gun. Well, no, wait, no, we're not. Um, so the AC2A only has a 300 watt inverter. So if I were to plug this heat gun into it, uh, the heat gun wouldn't even spin up. So that's not really an interesting test. Uh, what we're going to use instead is um, just a dimmer switch with some light bulbs on it. Um, very simple. So let's turn this on. Uh, let's get the AC side turned on. And let's get everything plugged in. There we go. We're going to start giving it some load. And we'll see how high up we can get uh, before it conks out. Now, these are old school analog light bulbs plugged into an old school analog dimmer is what I'm running here. So it won't hurt the light bulbs to get, give it less or more power. So there's 300 watts. That's about what it's rated for. And by the way, it can do a full drain at 300 watts from zero to full. Um, no issue there. Full to zero, excuse me. But let's uh, pump the power up and see how high we can get. This is a 300 watt rated device. And we're now pulling 400 watts from it. And 420 watts. And it seems to cut off at 420. We got that uh, blinking error again, which we can of course reset by turning the... Uh, turning the output back down so it doesn't overload the moment we turn it back on. 
hit the button to turn the error off and then hit the button again to uh, get it to come back on. But we're gonna actually run this test a second time. We're gonna run this once, um, as you just saw, and we're gonna run it again with pass-through power in UPS mode. So let's see if the UPS mode limit is any different than the built-in inverter. Now it shouldn't be. Um, if it is, then what's gonna wind up happening is you put a load on it that'll run happily from the wall, the power will go out, and then the device will go into overload immediately. So I'm hoping that the limit is, isn't any different, but we'll find out. So let's turn this on. There you go, there's power coming in. And we're charging, very good. Charging off AC. And let's start turning the power up. And I seem to remember 400 something. Okay, 320, 340, 380, 390, 400, 422. It was 420 last time, so. That's about the same, which is good. Um, interestingly, when it cuts off um, due to overload, do notice one more thing, uh, it stopped charging. So if it's plugged into AC power and it gets an error, it, it's not gonna keep charging. Uh, you'll have to go reset it first. If I turn that off, as soon as I clear the error, it starts charging again. Solar charging test. Let's see how fast this will charge from solar. Now, normally you see the power supply on top of the solar generator, not, not the other way around. But in this case, the AC2A is so small that if I were to put this power supply on top of it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't work. The power supply is too big. So it says something about the size of the device here. So let's start uh, turning up the voltage as usual. Let's see where it kicks on. Seven. Okay, so we're above 11 volts here and it hasn't kicked on yet. Let's see where it turns on. There we go, right around 12. So 12 volts we kick on. Give it a second to find the power. And we're gonna pull five amps and get 62 watts of 12 volts. I'll keep turning it up. So this is regular car power voltage and we're only at 78 watts. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's keep going up to 19 volts. And notice we're still at 78 watts. We haven't gone any faster yet and our current is going down. So let's keep going up. Let's rate for 28 volts. Let's go all the way to the max. That's close enough. You'll notice our, my current is now down to 2.8 amps. And we're still at 78 watts, so what the heck, what's going on here? This is the first Blue Eddy device that I have tested where the charging speed modes in the app affect solar. Right now, not sure if anybody noticed, the little icon here, it's set to silent mode. So I'm going to go in the app, and I'm going to change it from silent mode to standard mode. And watch the charging speed. It's going to jump up quite a bit higher. And now I'm going to go from, from standard mode and switch it to turbo mode. Okay, now I'm getting the full advertised 198 watts of input. 200 watts from the specs. However, be aware that if you have it in standard mode charging, go back to standard for a second. Now we're in standard again. 133 watts. My prediction is when this starts becoming generally available and people start using this with solar, people are gonna be very confused as to why you're not getting more than 133 watts from solar. You're gonna plug it into a 200 watt panel and you're only gonna get 133 watts. Why is that? Well, because it's current limiting itself to five amps, in this case, 4.9 amps, when it's in silent mode charging, which means it is ignoring part of your solar panel. The advantage here is that you can throttle it slower. Um, the battery in here is not that big. And a charge rate, or C rate, of one, which means it charges the battery in one hour, is about as fast as you want to go. A 200 watt panel going at 200 watts into a 200 watt hour battery will charge the battery in about an hour, plus or minus. You know, just do the math there. 
and that's pretty harsh on the battery. So this allows you to throttle it slower, so even if you're plugged into solar, you're not going to wear out your battery. It does mean, though, when you go, go get your brand new solar panel and you plug it in, you're going to notice that it's not going at full speed. So for the rest of this test, we'll do this spread one more time, but I'm going to switch it to turbo mode. There we go, now we've got turbo. And we'll go back down to 12, and we'll see how it actually behaves in turbo mode, which is how every other Blue Eddy behaves, is that it's set to full speed charging all the time, and you can't change it. So let's look at that. So it's a car that's turned off, which you never want to charge from. It should drain the car battery. 13.8, that's a running car, about 100 watts, pretty much the same as every other Blue Eddy device. Go up to about 19, that'll be your standard solar panel. There we go. 160 watts, again, pretty similar to other Blue Eddy devices in this size class. Um, 21, 22 volts, somewhere around there, that's your bigger panels. There we go, that's about halfway, we're st and now we're pulling 8.7 amps. So if you're going to be running like a Blue Eddy PV200, which is a 21-volt panel, you're going to pull 8.7 amps. The panel can give you 10 amps, so you'll pull the full 8.7, and you'll be charging around 186 watts from a 200-watt panel, which is about what you'd expect. That's, that's about right. Um, but the only way you're going to get that is if it's at the turbo mode. Let's keep going up. 22... Three current starts going down when I hit the maximum. 25, 26, 27. Now let's see if when we go above the maximum, we're 28, 29, right there, right in the middle of 29, 29 and a half, it cuts off to zero. So if you have a panel with the open circuit voltage of higher than 29, or higher than 28 really, um, if it ever gets above 29, it's just going to stop charging. So it, it's not even going to start charging. So if it's if it's fully charged and you plug it into a panel in the middle of the day, and your VOC is higher than 29, it, it's not even going to try to charge. It's just going to give you an error. Now let's see what happens if I turn the voltage back down. Does it start charging again automatically? Down like 24 there. That's back within range. You know, down to 19. And does it start charging on its own? It looks like it's trying to. A non-zero input. And there we go, it kicks back on on its own. That's exactly what we'd expect it to do. So very good. Okay, well, so what's the actual charging graph's curves look like? So here's the graph that I've measured. Uh, voltage versus solar charging rate in silent mode. You can see it won't, it won't ever go any faster than 77 watts. Here's standard mode, where it doesn't want to go any faster than 132 watts. And here's turbo mode, where you can get all the way up to the full 200 watts. Now let's compare this to, say, an EB3A. On the EB3A, it's, it doesn't have any mode except what the AC2A would call as turbo. Uh, and you'll see that the AC2A is actually a tiny, tiny bit faster at all voltage ranges than the EB3A. So they have improved it just a tiny bit. Now let's add in to the same graph the uh, standard mode charging. And you'll see that up to about 17 volts-ish, it's about the same. In other words, car charging isn't going to matter. But when you start getting into the solar panel range around 19 volts, it's going to matter. The EB3A is going to charge faster than the AC2A. Uh, simply because it doesn't have any way to slow it down. Uh, and the, the EB3A has a bigger battery also. So it can take that higher, faster charging rate. And if we add in the turbo mode, or excuse me, add in the silent mode, uh, now we'll see that it's actually even slower uh, in all cases. So if you get your brand new AC2A out of the box, you set it to silent mode and you plug it into DC source, it's going to take quite a while to charge. Maximum charging rate tests. Does it charge any faster? If you give it both solar and AC at the same time, or if you give it just one or just the other. So I've got it set in turbo mode here, uh, so it goes as fast as it can. First, we're going to go ahead and give it solar. 
turn up my voltage here. You give it above about 25 volts to peak it out. There we go. Okay, it's now charging at its rated about 200 watts input. And let's turn on the AC charger and see what happens here. Watch the current meter. This is how much power it's actually pulling from the solar panel in current. So this times that is the watts from the solar panel, which equals that. Turn this on. Now it has AC power. So it does go faster. Uh, instead of 200 watts, it jumps up to 270 watts. You can actually get faster charging by giving it AC. Uh, and it's still pulling the same power from the solar panels. That didn't go down. So it's preferring power from solar and adding another 70 watts from AC. Now let's try AC only in turbo mode. Cut off the solar. And it's back up at 265 instead of 274. So, yeah, if you want to max out charge it, you do get an extra 10 watts or so by giving it both solar and AC wall charging, but it's it's way easier just to th stick it in turbo mode and plug it into the wall, and you get basically the same charge rate. So really not a lot of benefit to dual charge. Uh, of course, unless it is a real solar panel, in which case then most of your power is free. Maximum sound level test. So let's see how much noise we can get this to make. In case you're sleeping near it. So first off, I have this in turbo mode. Uh, we'll turn it down to silent mode later, but first I want to try the eat as loud as it'll get. So let's give it solar. There we go. Give it a moment to find that and start charging. Okay, now it's got solar running. Next, I'm going to give it AC wall power. Now it's charging from both solar and AC wall power. Next, after that, I'm going to start adding an AC load. You can see I've already got the AC inverter turned on, which actually is going to just pass through power. It has a UPS feature in it. So my input, by the way, on this one, similar to the other smaller Blue Eddies, is the addition. It includes the pass-through power in it. So 270 up to 300. I don't really want to overload it. I already did. No. There we go. Now we're not overloaded. So now we have the maximum AC power that we can support coming out of it. And we have the maximum input coming into it. And we've got the fan turned up as high as it gets. Let's try the sound meter here. Wow, that's quiet. That's as loud as it gets. Now we're gonna do exactly the same thing. I'm not gonna change any of the wiring. I'm just gonna set it to silent mode. Okay, now it's in silent mode. Sound level hasn't changed because I'm maxing out the inverter. But if I turn my load off, Forty-three, forty-two. This is a very, very quiet unit. Um, it's going to be an excellent thing to have if you're in an environment where you absolutely need quiet. Because if you don't wind up pushing it real, real hard, and right before I did this test, I ran the solar charging test, like 30 seconds ago. So it's already warm from the solar charging test. And it, it's just, it's not getting very hot. It's not getting very loud. Nice, quiet unit passes that one with flying colors. AC charging rate and time test. So how I do this one, I have this voltmeter right here that has a recording feature in it. I hook it up to an amp probe, so it's actually measuring amps, and I put that on a uh, little bar that goes across the power cable. So now it's actually measuring the input power coming from the uh, wall outlet going into the AC2A. Uh, once every 60 seconds or so, it's going to take a recording and the little memory card that's in here, and then I'm going to output that to the computer and graph it. So, what do we have as far as our actual charging rates? So, the AC2A in turbo mode takes one hour and eight minutes. 
to get from zero to 100%. It uses 259 watt hours to do that out of a 200 watt hour battery, which means the charger is 77% efficient. So it is, of course, always pulling more power to charge than it goes into the battery. In standard mode, it takes two hours and eight minutes, and in silent mode, three hours and 49 minutes for the AC2A. Let's, of course, compare that to the EB3A. So first off, here's silent mode to silent mode. Uh, the EB3A, interestingly, far more efficient in silent mode. Um, very interesting there. Also, faster. EB3A charges a little bit over 100 watts in silent mode. It takes two hours and 48 minutes. And the AC2A takes three hours and 49 minutes for the same thing with uh, far less efficiency. Um, AC2A in standard mode versus EB3A. Uh, same thing, EB3A is faster. Um, the EB3A takes an hour and 13 minutes, 301 odd hours. And by the way, the EB3A has a larger battery also, so the efficiency is divided by that. Um, and the uh, AC2A takes uh, two hours and eight minutes for the same task. Uh, EB3A in turbo mode, you can see on the green line here, EB3A sort of hums along at a 420-ish watts until it gets too hot at about 35 minutes, and then it's got to cut back. That's that, that far drop there. Um, my opinion is EB3A is um, the cooling is not quite sufficient for the level of charge they have. Uh, they really ought to make the turbo mode a little bit slower, but it is what it is. So you get this weird, like, fast charge followed by slow charge thing. Uh, but it takes, uh, in EB3A, an hour and a minute. Um, so 18 minutes slower than standard mode. 81% efficient AC2A takes, uh, actually, interestingly, longer. Uh, an hour and eight minutes, and 77% uh, efficient. So if we're going to compare AC2A to EB3A, EB3A is kind of a clear winner here. It charges faster from zero to 100% in all three charging modes, uh, standard to standard, silent to silent, turbo to turbo, and is more efficient in that it wastes less percentage of the power. Again, standard to standard, silent to silent, turbo to turbo comparison uh, than the AC2A does. Could be an artifact of the size, not entirely sure. AC and DC discharge efficiency testing. So, um, as you guys know, I do pretty detailed tests. We're going to be comparing the AC2A with 70 hours and 36 minutes of total testing to the EB3A with 90 hours and 23 minutes of total testing. So, um, you know, about 160-ish hours of testing between the two. And that's just discharge testing. That doesn't include research, recharge times in it. As you can see here, I have a simple test set up. This one's discharging at 40 watts at DC through the cigarette lighter. So what's the actual numbers look like when you run them? So first off, in the lower right-hand corner, we've got a chart. The chart is the actual discharge times. So that's going to make this experiment more reproducible. So if you put 20 watts on an AC2A in AC mode, you should get a discharge time around 6 hours and 40 minutes, plus or minus a little bit of wiggle room. Now, my watts loading here for AC, of course, assumes a 100% uh, power factor, perfect power factor, so a purely resistive load. If you put something like a fan on it with a non-perfect power factor, uh, you're going to get less time. It's just, that's how AC works. They're, they're not perfect power users of power. They waste some of the power, so it is what it is. Uh, DC, same thing. Um, if you put a 20-watt uh, DC load on it, you're going to get somewhere around 8, eight hours and 22 minutes. Uh, every single one of the items in these boxes, these are all measured. These are not calculated. There's no math going on here. I hooked it up to a meter and let it run over and over again. That's why it took so long. So on the AC side, um, we have a nice, basically flat graph. A little bit below 90%, and 90%, uh, by the way, is the maximum on Blue Eddy devices. They hold 10% of the battery in reserve, which means you generally won't see greater than 90% discharge efficiency unless you happen to get real lucky, and the battery cells in your device actually hold more than the advertised maximum. Uh, on the DC side, you'll notice that the efficiency is far higher at lower wattage, in fact, down to about, uh, what is it, 60 watts? Um, everything below 60 watts, DC is more efficient than AC, and again, that's normal across all solar generators because uh, the AC inverter itself uses some power to stay on. So, just like everything else, it's just figuring out where the crossover point is. So, the numbers on their own, they're nice, they're interesting, and uh, interestingly go up to about 90% real quick. On the DC side, you can get, uh, what is it, 85% uh, at... Uh, 
86 uh, percent at 40 watts 87 percent at 20 watts so that's that's real efficient for tiny loads and that's really what this is designed for uh, the inverter only goes up to 300 watts but it's not designed for big loads so is what it is let's compare this number to the eb3a so on the dc side and now I have a graph that has the AC2A, the EB3A, and the AC60. So we're going to have three of the smaller units. Uh, the AC2A on the DC side is more efficient up until about the 60 watt mark. After that, it kind of becomes a tie between the AC2A and the AC60. The EB3A is a slightly older model than both of those and gets slightly lesser efficiency numbers than both of them, um, simply due to the nature of its an earlier device. Um, let's look at the AC side of the same three devices. Uh, the AC2A side, uh, the blue line here, is the most efficient of the three, uh, being that it's at the top, um, all the way to 200 watts. Uh, beyond 200 watts, it's the AC60. And the EB3A kind of lags behind the others in efficiency. Um, again, it's an older device. It's a generation back inverter. So as far as efficiency game is concerned... AC2A kind of wins at the low level, which is good because that's what it was designed for. Uh, but then beyond about 200 watts, the AC60 picks up and becomes the most efficient. So if you're going to be running loads routinely between the 200 watt and the 300 watt range on this inverter, you may want to significantly consider something bigger. Um, the battery in here is only 200 watt hours anyway, so at 200 watts with a 200 watt hour battery, you're fully discharging the battery in an hour. So if you're going to be routinely running loads that are larger than 200 watts, you probably want to consider a bigger unit. EB3A does make a strong showing. It is an older unit, um, and it holds its weight. Uh, but, just, you know, just it's showing a little bit of age here. The industry is moving super fast, so it's a little bit less efficient. Next up, I tend to measure the standby power usage for various power stations, um, including a number of Blue Eddy devices, which you see here. Uh, standby power is the power that is used internally within the device itself to keep the device running. This is the power that keeps the inverter going, which of course the inverter takes power even if you don't have anything plugged in. Uh, it keeps the screen going, it keeps the Bluetooth radio going, it keeps the cooling going, and something people don't think about is on the 12-volt side, the batteries natively in these devices, they're not 12 volts. You have to have a DC converter to get 12 volts out of it. It keeps the DC converter running. So, standby power, how do you measure this? Um, you put a small load on it. In uh, my case, I use 7.5 watts. Uh, the load has to be small enough that the cooling never kicks on because I don't want the fans to interfere with the process. Uh, then you let it run from 100% all the way down to 0% until it powers off with an error. And you measure how much power was given to your load tester. And however much power wasn't given to your load tester, that's how much power it used internally. Also calculate how much the manufacturer stores in reserve. And whatever was used internally is what we write down here. Uh, the reason you have to do a full discharge is because the battery meters aren't very accurate which means that the top, you know, 5% of the battery meter is not the same as the bottom 5% of the battery meter. So I can't just pick 5% of the battery meter somewhere in the middle and, and do a guess of how much it used because the battery meter doesn't really tell me that much. So instead of trusting the battery meter, I simply drain it all the way, full to dead, and then it doesn't matter what the meter says because at some point it dies. Anyway, so AC2A, um, it is the clear winner on the AC side. Um, less than 7 watts, uh, 6.83 watts to keep the inverter going. Very good, by the way. Um, however, uh, EB3A is not that far away. We're at uh, 0.2 watts higher for EB3A, and its inverters is uh, 600 watts instead of 300 watts. So it doesn't take a whole lot of extra power to get a bunch of extra power, if you know what I mean there. Um, that said, the small units are still much more efficient than the large units. If we jump down to the bottom and we compare uh, AC500 or EP500 Pro, the really monster units, um, we're looking at 40 watts just to keep the inverter running. So if you want to charge a cell phone, you're going to be wasting far more power just keeping the inverter turned on, assuming you're charging your phone from AC, uh, than, than you would actually be putting into the phone if you're charging off these big units. So that's what the little units are good for. 
On the DC side, same thing. AC2A, we're looking at 3.9 watts. EB3A, you're looking at 4.03 watts, so 0 .1, 0 0.1 watt different between the two. And the only ones that are really winners over that are going to be either the older units that were actually native 12 volts inside, where they didn't need a DC converter. Uh, the downside, of course, of being native 12 volts is it charges much slower. The higher the voltage you go, the less amps you need. Amps make heat. So higher voltage equals less amps equals charging faster in watts. Just math there. Um, with the only one that really wins, though, on the DC side is the B80 battery. And the reason it does is because it, it doesn't have a screen. Um, it's all sealed up. It doesn't have a fan. Um, it doesn't have fan ports because it's uh, water resistant. Um, it doesn't have Bluetooth. Um, it doesn't have an inverter. <laughs> so there's not a lot to it. And that's why it's got such a low power usage. But as far as a small device, AC2A, definitely a good performer. Uh, very, very similar to EB3A though. Very, very similar. The AC2A, like many other Blue Eddy devices, does have mobile app control. And since this is, might be many people's uh, first Blue Eddy device, being that this is the entry level one, uh, it kind of makes sense to cover the app in this video. So if you've already seen the app, you can see what's new in it. Uh, otherwise, we'll go through what the app can do. So let's bring up the app here. Very good. This is on a iOS device. And the first thing you'll do is you'll tap on the Blue Eddy icon. That'll load it up. And uh, you'll go to My Devices. And then you have a list of all your devices, including a few that I haven't made the video for yet, by the way. But uh, they've been announced, so you guys can see that I'm going to be working on them. Uh, we'll tap on AC2A. And this is going to connect by Bluetooth. Bluetooth is a short-range radio. Uh, it does not route over the internet, so you have to be within about 30 feet of your device in order to connect. Additionally, uh, with Blue Eddy devices, uh, off means off, which means that when this is turned off, you can't connect to it because it's off. The Bluetooth radio is powered down. Trying to talk to it from another radio isn't going to work. Uh, the reason they did that is because then it's not going to drain itself sitting on a shelf if you leave it on a shelf for two weeks. So it'll actually have some charge left when it's turned off. So that's a good thing. Um, but you've got to turn it on first before you can connect. Once you do connect, you can see a few things. So we've got the PV, the grid, the DC, and the AC icons here. Uh, PV and grid, those are inputs, which are doing nothing right now because I've got nothing plugged into it. Uh, and the outputs, the DC outputs turned on. That's going to prevent it from turning itself off while we're going through the, uh, the explanation here. So first I'm going to turn on some grid input. And we'll see what happens in the app. Icon turns green and we start pulling power. If I tap on the grid icon itself, it's going to load up and it's going to tell me power, current, and frequency. Uh, very useful to debug if you're plugging into uh, sort of wonky power and you're not sure what the frequency is. Uh, US spec standard, it needs to be between 59 and 61 hertz. If it's out of that range, it's, it's not going to behave nicely. So it needs to be rock solid, stable power here. And it tells you how much you're charging at. I'm going to go back. On the PV side, let me turn off my AC power and let me plug in my simulated solar here. There we go. On the PV side, let's tap on that and it's going to tell me power, voltage, and current, which is kind of what you need to know from solar panels. So we know that this solar panel right now is giving us 17.4 volts. And we also know that it's only pulling uh, 0.2 amps because we just plugged it in. It hasn't figured it out yet. There we go. Now it's jumped up 4.5 amps. And we're pulling 78 watts out of it, which is uh, because we're in standard mode charging. It's just not going to go any faster than that. Let's bail out of there. Unplug my simulated solar. And when I do that, you'll see the PV icon. It's going to go to zero. And then after 30 seconds or so, it's going to give up and uh, turn gray again. Now we can see DC down at the bottom. Uh, if I tap on that, uh, it does nothing. The only thing it's going to tell me is the output wattage. No, no additional information. If I tap on the AC output, it's going to give me uh, power, voltage, and current. And notice that it's, first off, the AC side's turned off. And secondly, notice my voltage is not zero. Uh, reason for that, this is a uh, prototype hardware. And they fix that in the actual production device where the uh, voltage doesn't show zero when you're not fully powered off. I'm going to plug in a load here and I'm going to turn it on. And you guys will see that it uh, actually does show the correct voltage when it actually turns on. There we go. 120 volts, 119 volts. And we're pulling 69 watts out of it at half an amp. 
and I can turn the AC side. Let's turn that back off in the app. So in the app itself, you can see I've got these switches down at the bottom. Let's take the AC one and turn that one back off. There we go, now we're off. Let's take the DC one, turn that off. And then turn DC back on. There we go, turn, control it remotely. Uh, below the percentage in the middle, we have a power button. If I push that, and then I also press the OK button, it'll actually turn it off. So you can turn it off from the app. Um, but you can't turn it back on. So be aware of that. Let's cancel that. Uh, what I mean by you can't turn it back on is you have to physically go over to the device and push the button to get it to turn back on, because off means off. At the bottom of the app here, we have PV generation and CO2 reduction. The PV gen generation, that's an interesting statistic. It counts how much wattage it's gotten through the uh, so uh, solar input through the life of the device, like an odometer. It's not counting how much solar input it got in the past week or in the past month. That's a lifetime counter. The CO2 reduction, that's simply math. It just multiplies it by a number, which we're going to see when we go into the settings. In the upper right-hand corner, we have this little gear icon. I'm going to tap on that. We've got the serial number. We've got an area that says user manuals. We can tap on that, and we can see the user manual in various different regions. So you can download that and take a look at it. You can share the device to someone else. That generates a QR code, which you could then have someone else scan the code into their app. Then their app can now control your device. So if you want to let your buddies control your device, that's how you do that. The device can actually only be paired with a single Blue Eddy account at a time. Carbon emission factor. Remember I said that the, uh, the CO2 output, it just multiplies it by a number? That's the number it multiplies it by. So if you guys want to change that, you can. Homepage display, that sets which device shows up on the main page. You can only have one. Charging mode, we'll tap on that. We can set standard, silent or turbo. It's in silent right now. Let's change it to standard. You can actually see the icon on the screen goes away. If I change it to turbo, you can see a different icon on the screen. Right up here, it shows up. It tells me I'm in turbo. Set it back to the standard. Power lifting mode turns on and off the power lifting mode. Eco mode, if I tap on that, I have an AC and a DC eco. Let's turn both on, see what they do. So what this does is it will turn off either the AC or the DC side when the power that you're using is below a preset amount for an amount of time. In other words, let's say the DC mode. If I use less than five watts of power for four hours, it will turn off the DC side. What this is useful for is, let's say you're using it as a battery charger. So I'm gonna charge my cell phone off the Blue Eddy. And I know my cell phone takes three hours to charge. So what I can do is I can set it to a low number with you know, some number that's smaller than the amount of power my cell phone pulls. And I can set it to say an hour and then an hour after my phone is done charging, because the number I set is smaller than the amount of power I'm pulling, it'll automatically shut itself off, so it's not sitting there leaving itself turned on all night. Very useful when camping if you're charging up devices. If you want it to stay on, though, and not turn off on you when you're not expecting it to, though, make sure you turn these back off, though. Uh, when I'm traveling with these, I tend to leave it on because if it jostles around in the bag and hits the button, I do want it to turn itself back off. But when I'm testing them, I leave it off. Uh, firmware upgrade, of course, you can check to see if there's new firmwares, which there isn't at the moment. And under advanced settings, there are two. So the AC output frequency, that is set per country. If you're in the United States, set it to 60 hertz. Um, if you're in a country that uses 50 hertz, set it to 50 hertz. Uh, that's mostly for Japan because they use the same plugs that we do. Um, don't set it to 50 hertz in the U.S. because you might damage your devices. That's a standard. All the power of everything in the U.S. is 60 hertz unless you're, you know, a dork like me and you want to play one with AC electronics and you want to set it to something different because you've got an appliance that uses it. Uh, grid self-adaption. So let me hit the little question mark here. Get a lot of questions on what this does. So grid self-adaption sets the UPS mode in there to be more optimized for brownouts than blackouts, which means it won't switch off the AC power as fast. It will not be as aggressive of switching it off. So that means if you have an AC power source that's not as stable, let's say a generator, and you're running off the generator, if you turn this on, it might charge better from that generator. 
However, it won't be as aggressive in switching to UPS mode, which means when you turn the generator off, it's going to take too long to switch to UPS mode and your device might lose power. Whatever you have plugged into it might lose power for about a third of a second. And a third of a second is long enough if you've got a laptop with no battery in it or if you've got um, anything sensitive, CPAP machine that doesn't have battery backup, something like that, uh, clock on a microwave, it might reset the clock. So that's what that's for. Um, it's off by default and most people should leave it off. Um, the only reason you'd want to turn it on is either if you're in an area where you get far more brownouts than blackouts and you want to optimize for that, or if you just have terrible power. Uh, this, by the way, will not make it charge from a square wave uh, uh, inverter. So if you've got a car with a built-in inverter, uh, this, this isn't going to fix it. Okay? And that's the app. Based on feedback from the EB3A, I have decided to add another test to this that I have not done in any of my other videos. So what we have here, of course, is a time-lapse recording. But this is the time-lapse recording of the AC2A running in UPS mode with a constant 150 watt load on it, where it's running at the 150 watt load for 48 hours. So I put the load on it and I just let it run and I pointed a camera at it and let it record. I also have, as you can see in the camera, a meter hooked up to the device where the meter is taking a recording every, uh, every minute and a half or so. Uh, there's a thousand data points on the graph over 48 hours. You guys can do the math and figure out how, how many seconds between recordings, but it's every minute and a half or so and is recording the uh, voltage coming out of the AC2A. Uh, meaning not only are we monitoring it by video, we are also monitoring it on a graph, which you're going to see in just a minute. Um, and it, it handled it just fine. Um, EB3A, especially the early ones, had trouble with running the UPS mode at anything higher than about 40 watts. Um, it would overheat and turn off. Um, AC2A doesn't seem to have that problem. It looks like they fixed it. So, yay! Um, one interesting tidbit, by the way, you're about to see here on the, uh, on the screen, part of the way through the recording of this, my power company did something and the voltage coming out of the wall dropped by about five volts. And then it went all kinds of wonky for a little while. AC2A didn't care. Um, it continued running. It didn't throw any errors. Didn't have any problems. No problems at all. As you can see, uh, here's the graph. Um, you can see the voltage coming out of it is uh, flat and boring. And there's two spots over the 48 hour period where the voltage just kind of uh, goes lower. Now it is within spec, by the way. I'm, I'm not going to beat on my power company too much. Um, 115 volts is absolutely within the US spec, so there's no problem there. But uh, it is a little strange that the voltage is, you know, flat most of the day and then a couple of times during 48 hours it just kind of goes a little wonky. But AC2A handled it just, just fine, just like a champ. So. I don't see any issue at all with using this as a uh, UPS device for critical loads. Right, next for science, we're going to demonstrate what happens if we run it from horribly crappy power. Um, just to show what happens if you have a you know vehicle, uh, most American manufactured vehicles uh, do not come with uh, good quality inverters built into the car. And what happens if you try to charge it off a crappy one? So first off, uh, what I have here in my experimental setup is I have my oscilloscope here, uh, which is uh, battery powered. First off, every time you use a mains oscilloscope, you always have to run it off battery uh, through an attenuator, and that's running to the mains power. This is actually a graph of the horrible, horrible power that is coming out of this cheap inverter that I spent an entire $16 on for this uh, experiment. We can also see the total harmonic distortion of this meter, or of the uh, inverter. I have a 41% distortion, which means actually only about 60% of my power even looks like a sine wave, because 40% of it is distortion. So that's that's terrible. But uh, it's absolutely right, because you can see on my oscilloscope over there that it's just it's it's horrible power. So I'm going to swap the oscilloscope from the input power, unplug it from the wall here, and I have an outlet on here so that I don't zap myself, plug it into the AC2A, there we go. Next, now you see I have no power coming out. 
Um, I'm going to turn on the AC output and we're going to run the oscilloscope off the internal uh, power source here. So now I'm running off the inverter of the AC2A. And I still have that horrible, crappy power sitting on the side here. Next, I have this power cord right here. That's running to a power switch, which is then coming off of that horrible inverter that I showed you a minute ago. I'm going to move the microphone over closer to the AC2A so you can hear the relays clicking as I plug it in. Okay, so this is, we're, we're trying to demonstrate what it should do is reject that horrible crappy power to protect itself from being damaged. So hopefully it does reject the power and refuse to charge and throw an error. That's what I'm hoping it does. Let's see what it does. Let's throw the switch here and see what it does. And as expected, we got an error. So it's refusing to charge from the horrible power source, which is good. It's protecting itself from charging. But it does mean if you see this error happen when you plug it into the inverter built into your vehicle, that's why it's doing that. AC2A UPS mode testing. So what we're looking for here is we're going to measure how long it takes to switch from external power. Right now we've got it plugged into the wall and it's charging to battery power, which is what happens whenever you're plugged into input power and you either unplug the cable without turning the AC off or you have a power outage. You can see on my meter, I've got two sets of leads plugged in. The first set, the blue one, that's just going right here to this nine volt power brick. I'm pulling some power from the nine volt power brick with this load tester. It's actually 8.69 volts instead of 9 volts, and I'm pulling a 0.88 amps. It's a 1 amp power brick, so I'm pulling near the maximum. The other side of this is actually running into the meter, the blue line here, and that's going to be triggering the oscilloscope to tell it when to take a reading. The yellow line is actually the AC power coming out of the device. So let me reproduce this graph you're seeing right now simply by putting it into trigger mode, and then I unplug it. So I've got a nice AC waveform coming in, and then when my DC power supply loses power, because of course I unplugged it, it stops reading. And my AC line also stops reading because it's plugged into the same power strip. So what we're going to do now is that same test, except instead we're going to do it by flipping the input power switch right here. That's going to cut the power going into the AC2A from the wall, at which point the AC2A will flip from the UPS pass-through mode to the built-in battery and recover the power. So we should see a nice AC waveform. Then uh, when it's recovering in the middle, we'll see some junk. And then after that, we'll see a nice AC waveform again. Let's go ahead and run that test. Let's flip the switch and see what happens. There we go. We've got a good reading. Let's take a look at this reading. So what we're going to do with the oscilloscope here is measure the distance between when the uh, AC waveform starts getting wonky and when it recovers. So in order to do that, we're going to go into the measure menu. I pick the cursor type. I'm going to set its time. Set the A side here to when it starts getting broken. It's about there-ish. Set the B side. Excuse me, I'm going to hit B side to where it starts to recover. Just right around there. So from that line to this line. A to B is 11.8 milliseconds. So we are well under the 20 millisecond requirement in order for this to not affect our devices. Can the AC2A be expanded to have additional battery capacity? Well, sort of. It doesn't know how to control an external battery natively, but it can charge from an external battery. So in this case, I've got a Blue Eddy B80 here, and I've got the B80 cable. It's got the uh, airline on one side and the XT60 on the other. That's the right cable for this one. So let's go ahead and plug that cable in. And then you just push it in until it clicks. There we go. We've got that in. And then we've got the XT60 side goes into the solar input. Then on the B80 itself, we push and hold the power button until it starts to blink. And when it starts blinking, we let go of it. Hold it for too long, it'll turn back off. There we go. Now it's blinking. So now the B80 battery is in what's called power bank mode. 
that's going to feed power through this cable into the solar input and recharge the AC2A. In fact, it's going to recharge it at 193 watts, 192 watts, basically the max charge rate. And I do have this set to uh, turbo mode charging here. Now, the B80 battery itself has a timeout. It's going to turn itself off after four hours, which is plenty long enough to recharge the AC2A. But let's say you want to have this set up and hook solar panels up to it. Well, you can. The B80's got a solar input on it. But now the B80 will turn itself off after four hours. So the way to prevent this, and yes, I have tested this, is all you got to do is push the DC button. Now, first off, these outputs are turned on. And secondly, now the B80 won't turn itself off. It'll stay on forever now. This next test was suggested to me by our Facebook group. So, I have a backpack. The question is, does the AC2A fit in a backpack and can it be easily transported? So I have a pretty common backpack. These are what, like $25, $30 now. Used to be a very fancy brand, apparently not anymore. So, take the AC2A and put it in the backpack. Of course, it's turned off right now. There we go. It's got it in there and uh, put a little jacket thing in there too, just for to show that it's not using up the whole backpack. And there we go. Got an AC2A in a bag. Now, if you were going to transport it this way, I do recommend uh, covering up the buttons with something so that the buttons don't get pressed when they're in the bag. That's actually kind of an issue with all soft-sided containers and uh, technological devices that have buttons on the outside. Uh, it's not limited to Blue Eddy devices or even solar generators. You really don't want it turning itself on when it's in the bag. But can you carry it around in a bag? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say you can. We've now run just about every test I can think of and a few tests that I had to have some help from others to come up with on the AC2A and it behaved very well. Um, the main competition for the AC2A is probably Blue Eddy's own EB3A. Blue Eddy itself is in a market leader position now, which means for better or for worse, their primary competition is themselves. So. AC2A or EB3A? Well, um, AC2A is better at uh, efficiency. It's smaller. Um, it's got a newer inverter in it. Um, however, EB3A has more battery capacity and charges faster. So, kind of depends on what you need. Um, EB3A has got a few more ports that AC2A doesn't have. Uh, as far as pricing on these models as of right now, there isn't a whole lot of difference between the price on these two. Uh, EB3A, of course, being a little bit more expensive than uh, AC2A, but not, not a lot. I mean, we're talking sub 50 bucks difference between these two models. So which one do you want? Kind of depends on your use case. Um, but they both behaved very well. Uh, neither one had any huge red flags. Um, I will call out that if you're going to be running long running loads, uh, the long running load test, the AC2A did very, very well on that test. Uh, the EB3A I did not even show the results of because it can't do the test. So um, if you're going to be using it as a UPS device for long running loads for higher than, than zero power, uh, definitely you want the AC2A between the two of them. Um, other than that, um, you know, they, the results seem to speak for themselves. So, um, as always, uh, let me call out, uh, I am not paid to make these videos. Um, Luetti does, of course, send me the device because otherwise, how would I have it? It you know, must have had it before it came out in order to do the testing because this testing does take uh, hundreds of hours. Um, I'm, but they don't pay me to do it. Um, they don't get to see the video before it comes out publicly. They don't get to comment on the results. Um, they don't get to tell me to change the results, obviously. They have no, no influence over what it is that I'm posting here. Um, I make these videos because they're fun to make, um, not because I'm paid. And as long as I keep having fun making them and you guys keep having fun watching them, I'll keep making them. So thank you all for coming. Until next time.